and welcome everybody. My name's Julia Cirillo and I'm the Water Watch and the Rapid Response to Litter Coordinator at Mary Creek Management Committee. I'm also um, the moderator and introducer for today's workshop. Helping out with chat, as you just heard, um, is my colleague at MCMC, uh, Dr Angela Foley. So she'll be helping out with chat. Uh, I'd like to introduce our presenters for today, uh, fellow presenters. We've got Anne McGregor and Freya McGregor. Anne is the Vice President of the Friends of Mary Creek, President of the Mary Creek Management Committee, Committee of Management, and founder, along with her husband Bruce, of the Nature Stewards Program. Freya is their Outreach Coordinator for Ray Brown's Talkin' Birds, a US radio show and podcast about birds, birding and conservation. So pretty um, excited to have a, a US connection today and so Freya is joining us from over in the United States. The Talkin' Birds website has lots of ideas and advice about plurting at talkinbirds.com uh, forward slash plurting, which I'm certainly happy to put into the chat. Freya is an occupational therapist based in the United States and she's coordinator of Birdability, a, a, a non-for-profit organisation that works to ensure the birding community and the outdoors are welcome and accessible for everybody, particularly people with a disability and other health concerns. Just a little bit about Friends of Mary Creek for those that don't know. The Friends of Mary Creek has been operating for over 30 years and has over 550 active members, which is pretty amazing. The Friends of Mary Creek activities include planting, citizen science activities, flora and fauna surveys, advocacy and education about the Mary Creek catchment, as well as a large litter cleanup presence on the riparian zone. Friends of Mary Creek work in close partnership with Mary Creek Management Committee. Mary Creek Management Committee is a not-for-profit environmental coordination and management agency formed way back in 1989 to achieve a shared vision for the waterway corridors of the Mary Creek catchment. Its members include all municipalities of the catchment, the cities of Darabin, Hume, Moreland, Whittlesea and Yarra. And uh, thank you to the city of Yarra who's supporting today's event. Uh, oh, of course, and Mitchell, plus the Friends of Mary Creek and the Wallen Environment Group. And representatives from these groups form the Committee of Management that guide MCMC's activities. And MCMC employs around 20 staff, including education, management and biodiversity management staff with extensive expertise. Before we get going, um, I just wanted to also acknowledge, do an acknowledgement to country. I am today standing on the traditional owners, uh, the Wurundjeri uh, Woiwurrung people, and I'd like to pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. And um, I welcome all um, any elders that are in our audience today um, and all countries um, from, from around, uh, around Victoria and perhaps around the world. So I think we might, um, we might get started, I think. Um, so I think we're going to have uh, Freya and Anne start about what actually is plurting and why do we plurred? Thanks so much, Julia. Hi, everyone. Um, my name's Freya McGregor. Um, as Julia said, I'm the outreach coordinator for a radio show and podcast about birds and conservation that's in um, based in the US, but we do have listeners around the world. So, hey, if you need a 30 minute podcast, that's kind of about a few different birds that you might never see along the Mary Creek. Um, you should check us out. Um, it, that's in my spare time. Um, my full time job is, um, as Julie mentioned, the coordinator of a brand new nonprofit that uses my skills as an occupational therapist and um, is all about um, enabling and empowering and making sure that the birding community and the outdoors is inclusive, safe, welcoming and accessible to people with disabilities and other health concerns. So there's the plug for birdability. Um, I also see someone in the audience here who I won't out, but was one of my former lecturers, um, which is really cool. Um, so that was a very unexpected delight. Um, there you go. Occupational therapy is amazing. If you don't know about it, you should. Um, anyway, uh, mom, do you want to introduce yourself while I share my screen? Sure. Oh, by the way, that's my mum. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Freya, for that. Um, We're keeping I'm this Anne, in the family. I love it. I'm Anne McGregor. Um, and as, as and Julia has introduced me already, I could also add, as the slide says there now, I'm the coordinator of the Friends of Mary Creek Bird, Bird Watch or Bird Surveys, which are held at uh, 10 sites along the Mary Creek and at Edwards Lake in Reservoir, uh, four times a year. Unfortunately, the September surveys will be uh, not public, only people who live locally who can exercise uh, on the survey route that our leaders will be doing those surveys. But normally we do welcome everybody to join our surveys and help uh, monitor birds and learn a little bit more about our local birds. So uh, you can check the Friends of Mary Creek website for uh, details 
on future surveys. So, um, Freya, you're going to start, um, but I'd also like to, uh, right at the beginning, thank um, the photographers for the, the bird photos that we're using, the, the Mary Creek bird photos that we're using today. Uh, Peter Mollison and Adie Tudor, and Adie's in the audience, I notice. <laughs> Hi, Adie. Um, beautiful photos. They've taken almost all the photos we're using have been taken on or very near Mary Creek. So that's really great. Thank you to both of you. Back, back to you, Freya. Plurting. Plurting is picking up litter while birding. Um, we certainly didn't invent this idea at Talking Birds. Um, a lot of people do pick up litter while they're out birding, but um, we probably, Ray, uh, the host and my boss, who's here tonight as well, probably invented the word. Uh, a lot of people find it kind of hilarious. But once you say it enough, it comes naturally. Um, by the way, I should also mention, just because it's an interesting cultural um, link, that um, birding, uh, because of, well, there's a whole lot to go into there. But when I say birding, I mean bird watching or bird listening or bird enjoying or any way that you might enjoy wild birds. Um, it doesn't have to involve watching. So um, I'm a big proponent of using birding to be a little bit more inclusive um, of all the different ways that people can enjoy birds. So picking up litter while birding. Um, we have a whole stack of ideas on the Talking Birds website at talkingbirds.com slash plurting for ways that you might go plurting as an individual, uh, as part of a group, like during the um, Mary Creek bird survey or if you're in the US at a bird club or an Audubon chapter bird outing um, if you're attached to a nature center or places like maybe Ceres or or any um, outdoor place how they might encourage people to go plurting um, and even bird festivals there's quite a lot of bird festivals in the US um, and how they might go plurting too so please check them out we're only going to cover a couple of ideas tonight so if none of these seem to fit with the way you go outside and enjoy birds um, there might be another one so please please check it out and see if there's one that you can kind of slot into your regular birding and make it even better because it's plurting. Uh, so these graphics were made in the US so the graphics all have a North American bird on them um, but we have a corresponding Mary Creek bird next to it so this is a greater sage grouse in the G and um, they're kind of giant chooks basically with amazing um, displays uh, and there's a lady in the bird blind or the bird hide um, uh, checking checking out this display dance up the top there's a crunched up piece of litter and it says trash equals treasure having that approach to plurting can make it kind of fun and a bit more like a game rather than a chore because who wants to pick up litter but if it's a fun thing like a treasure hunt or like an easter egg hunt then that's so much more exciting especially for kids uh, so changing your kind of mindset into this trash equals treasure idea uh, is definitely one way to begin your plurting adventures uh, i should um Asterisk myself here. I've been living in the US for five years now, and there's a few American words that have crept into my vocabulary. So um, please excuse them. Um, <laughs> I think that's great, Freya. I think we're all going to learn a little bit more uh, vocabulary. So keep it going. <laughs> um, so, Mum, there's no greater sage grass on the Mary Creek, but what else might folks see when they're floating on the creek? Uh, well, something much smaller would put in here a grey fantail, which is a cute little fellow. So very active and acrobatic, bits about the lower canopy, uh, planning its tail all the time, and trilling or chattering, quite, quite vocal. You'll often hear them about before you see them. And if you're poking about looking for litter uh, on the ground or, or in the uh, vegetation along the creek, you might find a grey fantail, often part of a mixed flock. So you might hear them and they'll lead you to other birds. If you're in the US uh, or North America, um, grey fantails are a lot like gnat catchers in that they're small and they move and they do that shimmy thing with their tail. Um, so, and if you're in Australia, yeah, greater sage grass is like a really fantastic chook. <laughs> Another way to go floating in a group, not right now, um, but in a group is to have group cleanups because many hands make light work. And it can feel really fun to do something like this with your friends. Certainly not right now, but um, 
focusing on waterways like the Mary Creek, um, rivers and um, lakes and the beach is, is a really important thing to do because so much trash that ends up in the oceans started out on the streets or out in the world and it went down the waterways um, through stormwater drains and through the creeks and rivers into the ocean. And ocean plastic is a really, really big problem um, for a lot of birds. Uh, these are American oyster catchers, which are very similar to Australian oyster catchers, uh, and um, they for sure are not interested in having trash in their homes. We don't, we don't have oyster catchers on the creek. They're, they're uh, seawater, sort of seashore birds, but um, we occasionally have a powerful owl. Another O, you probably worked out now that we're working through go flirting. <laughs> um, uh, so it's Australia's largest owl, pretty impressive. They're at least 600 millimetres, 60 centimetres long. Uh, if you're a North American, they're a bit bigger than the great horned owl. Not very often seen along the Mary Creek, but um, a Deakin University study has tracked one that moves up and down the Yarra Valley. And this is probably her. She was uh, roosting beside the Mary uh, in North Fitzroy a year or two back. And um, pretty exciting. The preferred food is possum. Uh, they, they commonly roost along creeks. And if you want to learn more about powerful owls, uh, there was a webinar in September last year, which is uh, recorded and available on the Mary Creek Management Committee website. If you're in North America, it's not the possum you're thinking. Um, <laughs> Australia has a lot of different kinds of possums, um, lots big, big ones, tiny little things. Uh, in North America, it's, it's really an opossum um, that looks, unfortunately, like a rat, but they're really fantastic and you should love them because they eat lots of ticks and ticks are bad news. Um, Mum, what kind of possums do powerful owls eat that aren't opossums? Uh, they're marsupials, so ringtail possums and uh, brushtail possums. They do also apparently attack uh, and eat birds, even a white copper too, and I can just imagine the noise if a <laughs> powerful owl pounced on it white cockatoo that was snoozing away one, one night. Anyway. <laughs> also, this is the look for sure. This powerful owl's glare is the look that everyone who drops litter intentionally should be getting from everyone around them. That, that level of like... Um... <laughs> <laughs> Disdain. Yes, and, and menace almost. Um, anyhow, if you have limited time or limited capacity to carry any of the litter or the trash that you're picking up, or if you're like me and chronically forget to bring an old um, single use um, shopping bag with you to collect your trash. Uh, I use, I on the way out, as I'm going out um, birding, I am looking and listening for birds, but on the way back, you tend not to see as much or hear as much, or you've sort of already encountered those birds on that outing. And so I use my, because I'm right-handed and I want my right hand for my binoculars, I use my left hand to pick up, to pick up trash. You can only carry so much in one hand though. You can carry quite a lot, <laughs> but still you are somewhat limited. And so if you only have a limited, um, limited capacity, carrying capacity, focusing on monofilament like this lady is doing or fishing line is really, really helpful. You'll get a lot more bang for your buck in terms of making a positive difference for birds. Monofilament, is thin, it's clear, it's really strong. These all make it great for fishing line uh, and terrible for birds. A lot of birds uh, get tangled up in fishing line. A lot of um, sea, sea animals, um, turtles and seals, a whole lot of stuff get all tangled up and because it's so strong, um, they can't get out of it. Their beaks, their wings, their legs, uh, it can cause them a lot of trouble and it very often leads to death. So if you, um, if you have one thing to focus on, taking a handful of monofilament out of the environment and disposing of it um, in an actual bin uh, or trash can, um, <laughs> depending on what country you're in, um, is really, really valuable and, and definitely helpful. Um, Atlantic puffins, which are incredibly cute, uh, definitely are at risk from monofilament. And so we want to definitely keep that out of their way if we can at all times. So obviously we don't have Atlantic puffins in Australia, but we do have Pacific black ducks. These are quite common ducks. They're actually brown, not black, as you can see. Uh, almost a black stripe through the eye, which is quite diagnostic. 
they, they are dabbling ducks, so they up in, put their heads down in the water and feed on the seeds of aquatic plants. Uh, they have a um, very bright green, iridescent green strip on the wing. You can see when they fly or flap their wings. Um, sort of over here, right, Mum? Yes, yes, about there. Which can be purple at times, and that can be an indicator that they're actually a hybrid with a mallard and also northern um, hemisphere duck. A mallard, mallards have been introduced into Australia, uh, and so there's quite a lot, quite a few hybrids. But this family, happy family of of duck and ducklings was uh, on the Jones Park wetland in East Brunswick, I think. They, the Pacific black ducks look a little bit like um, a few duck species in North America where in fact mallards are native, but there are domestic mallards. And then there's a bunch of stuff that's hybridized with the native mallards here too as well. So it seems like ducks just, just enjoy, <laughs> enjoy life. <laughs> Oh, hang on. Have you got, we've got, you, we've got a bonus, bonus P, Tom? <laughs> yeah, bonus P here. I couldn't just putting this one in. It's such a sinister fellow, the pied currawong. People could are probably hearing them around. They're more common in the cooler months in Melbourne, although they do hang around all year nowadays because there's so much food. They're, uh, they look at the solid beak. Um, they, they, that's good for eating all sorts of things including, I'm afraid, uh, nestlings of other species. And um, there's, a, there's another currawong along the Mary. Both species are nesting at the moment, I'm told, along the creek in various places. The grey currawong, which is a bit greyer, <laughs> not, not so dark, doesn't have white on the rump like the pied currawong and has quite a different call. It's a clinking call instead of the currawong call. But that's and the, the eye color, Mum, does that, does that, is that diagnostic? It doesn't, doesn't help much. doesn't help. Oh, wow. Do you want to do a, um, a rendition of what it sounds like? No, uh, I'm no good at all at bird calls. Sorry, Gillian. <laughs> Actually, you know what does have bird calls? Um, there's an amazing app. This is a total tangent. There's an amazing app called the Merlin Bird ID app, and it's free to download. Um, it's created by the Cornell Unit Lab of Ornithology, which is in North America, but they have an Australian bird pack. And it's a really nifty tool. If you're out birding, um, you can it can help you identify a bird that you're not sure about. You put in a few key um, like observations that you've made. It, it tells you what ones to put in. Um, it doesn't always get them completely right, but it can give you a bit of a ballpark. But... Uh, it also has all the calls and the range maps and stuff for all the species, and you can just look up different species. So if you were not sure what kind of currawong was calling, turn your phone right down because you don't want to be interfering with um, with the birds that are around by by calling something that isn't really there. And but have a listen, um, and you can play play that call um, and see if it if it was a pied currawong or a grey currawong. There you go. Random plug for Mill and Bird ID. Yeah, thanks, Brian. Yeah, so there's a question there about could you repeat the name of the app? Merlin. The Merlin Bird ID app. M E R L I N. Merlin. Yeah. And I would also think the Bird Birds Australia app, like the Birds and Backyards coming up, which I'll give a plug a bit later on. But I think they've also got the calls um, of the bird local birds too, don't they, Anne? Is that a good app for people to download in Melbourne? Um, I, I'm afraid I don't have the app. Um, there's certainly the Birds and Backyards website has calls, recordings of the calls in their bird finder pages, yes. Yeah, and I think Museum Australia and Museum Melbourne also have quite good bird apps here too. Yay, bird apps. Yeah, they're everywhere. Um, <laughs> it's amazing to think five years ago there wasn't really any and now there's lots. <laughs> yeah, and free and helpful, always, always awesome. Um, there's lots of different ways to go birding. You don't have to do it while walking down a trail because you don't have to go birding only walking down a trail. Um, this lady is out on her in her kayak um, removing some six pack rings from a lake. Now these things are these things these birds um, are delightful birds. They're common loons. If you have ever been to North America and heard a common loon call, they make some incredible sounds. Often at dusk or dawn on these wonderful lakes, and it's super eerie and amazing. And they're really beautiful birds. They're not related to ducks at all. Um, they're big birds. Anyway, um, I'll stop on the the fangirling of the common loons but um, the um, plastic six pack rings are another really really helpful thing to take out of the environment especially if you have limited capacity to carry the litter that you're picking up while you're plurting um, similar to monofilament and, and any like anything that 
can be a complete circle. Um, birds can get their heads and necks and beaks and their wings and their legs and feet tangled up in that circle and can't get themselves out. Uh, so, again, that often leads to death, uh, which is bad. <laughs> so another handy thing, you, you might have heard of this before, uh, if you if you ever are buying beer or anything that has these plastic six-pack rings, just getting a pair of scissors and cutting through all of those circles before you, um, before you responsibly dispose of the six-pack ring uh, can be really helpful because, of course, you put your litter in a bin, but you never quite know if maybe it'll fly out of the garbage truck or get blown off the dump somewhere and end up in the ocean as complete six pack rings. So um, just scissor through it and it'll end up being this really weird looking long piece of, of plastic, but it'll definitely pose less of a threat if it does happen to get out into the, into the environment. So we don't have the wonderful loons in, in Australia, but we do have wonderful parrots and lorikeets, which are our owl bird here. Instead of the, the rainbow lorikeet, which I think nearly everyone's familiar with in uh, northern Melbourne, I've put up the musk lorikeet, which is a bit smaller than the rainbow. They, they're very noisy. They feed the ne nectar feeders, uh, very noisy flocks feeding in flowering eucalypts, uh, mostly green. And you can see the red forehead and a band on the side of the head through the eye, red band. They do have a shorter tail in flight than the rainbow lorikeets. So, um, and a different, if a different call, they 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 shriek, um, <laughs> very hectic call as they fly. So uh, keep an eye out for musk lorikeets. Instead of going plurting by yourself, you can also go plurting with a partner. Um, when I was rehearsing this with mum, I was stumbling around with plurting with a buddy and suddenly realised you could go plurting with a partner. Um, plurting with a partner is great because someone can carry the bag and someone can be picking up the trash. Um, using a single-use shopping bag that ideally you don't have many of because you all use fabric shopping bags, uh, but there's probably a few lying around that can be very well um, recycled in this in this way um, is, a, is an easy way to collect your trash and um, having a long handled uh, litter pickup stick or tra long handled trash grabbers um, is a great way to go plurting because one, you don't have to touch the litter yourself, which is excellent, especially during a pandemic. Uh, and the other is you don't have to bend down to pick it up. Um, take it from me, bending down to pick up litter a lot can, <laughs> can kind of make you a bit sore. But if you have um, bad knees or a bad back or bad hips or anything, it can also be really difficult. So make your life a little easier. Um, and you may be able to buy a long handled um, trash grabber from like, at, like Bunnings or if you're in North America, Home Depot and Lowe's, I believe, sell them. Or if you're in North America, if you have a local Keep America Beautiful affiliate, like Keep San Antonio Beautiful, for example, they'll often have them to loan out. But if you're along Mary Creek. I've got some. So um, I actually do, I have offering a click and collect uh, process at the moment. So I do actually have a litter kit that's got quite a number of um, pieces of equipment for groups. And obviously in the moment in Melbourne, we were in lockdown. So we can only go plurting with a buddy or a partner or, or your household. So um, I'm actually lending out gloves and pick up sticks and bags, which you can hold on to for the duration of lockdown and then return them to me. So it's just a matter of emailing me and um, telling me how many you want, how many bags, gloves and pick up sticks or one or the other. And just uh, coming to my place, which is in Brunswick West, so not too far away and um, you know, picking them up. So there's there's certainly that option as well. You don't need to, to buy them, but it's great to know that there are options of buying them as well. By the way, if you were wondering about the woman um, in the background of that graphic, um, she has not got a pickup stick. That is a long cane or a white cane, um, which is a tool that a lot of folks who are blind or have low vision use to help them know where they are uh, in space as they get around um, outside in the community. So she's birding by ear. That's why her hand is up near her, near her ear. Um, indigo buntings, that's the male at the top that's bright blue. The female is a more yellowy kind of olive color. Um, they are amazing. If you need an excuse to visit North America at some future point in time, um, indigo buntings are incredible. They 
are all blue and the most amazing blue when the sunlight hits them um, because like there's actually no such thing as um, a blue bird uh, despite what your eyes tell you that's actually a trick of the light and the way the um, light hits the pigmentation in the feathers um, creates that blue that we see which is why when a blue bird is in the shadows it'll look kind of black um because because it's all it's all about the light but indigo buntings are incredible if you ever get the chance to see one well along the mary our eye bird is the silver eye <laughs> a very small bird very small but quite vocal you often hear them twittering or warbling or the high-pitched steep noise they seem to talk to each other all the time they're often in in small groups or small flocks they eat fruit and nectar and insects, so they move through the uh, canopy. They can come down quite low to the ground. This one's feeding on a local indigenous plant, ruby saltbush, probably near Brunswick Velodrome, I think. And um, they're, even though they're very small, quite a number of them fly across Bass Strait from Tasmania for winter. Remarkable journey. And um, the, the Tasmanian birds tend to have chestnut brown flanks rather than a buff flank from some of the most of the mainland birds so keep an eye out for silver eyes you can see them in your backyard too especially if you have fruit trees about the size of a wobbler if you're in north america little little plump <laughs> plump wobbler <laughs> Ah, uh, these are roadrunners roadrunners are fantastic by the way they don't say meet me uh, <laughs> Artistic license is an amazing thing. They are, however, incredibly awesome. Uh, I haven't seen one pulling pranks on a coyote. They're actually pretty shy. Um, when you kind of get to them, they want to be out of the way, out of your way. But um, they do have purple on the head, not a giant plume. They have a little bit of purple in their eye makeup, which is really, really beautiful. Um, but I, I, pro I promise you won't be disappointed when you do see a roadrunner in real life. They are fantastic. Just nothing like the cartoon. Another thing that's really helpful to focus on when you're plurting is balloons. Um, balloons are bad news because what goes up must come down and uh, balloons pop and then they look remarkably like jellyfish and other tasty delights in the ocean. Uh, however, they're not digestible and there's a horrendous amount of seabirds and um sea turtles that have been found they've died and when they've done an autopsy they've found not just a couple of bits of balloons in their in their um gastrointestinal tract but like huge clumps and that's sometimes what's caused the death their, their whole insides have been clogged up by eating what they didn't realize uh, was not food so um there's a really great organization in the U.S. called Balloons Blow, Don't Let Them Go. And if you have always used balloons to help celebrate um, birthday parties and things like that, have a look at their website because they have some really cool ideas of more sustainable, um, planet-friendly um, alternatives to using balloons to help celebrate because it's better not to be in the environment in the first place. Uh, these two are mylar balloons. They're particularly bad. They're the ones that are sort of like aluminium like alfoil stuff that kind of crunkle. They often have, they're often in really interesting shapes and they'll have things printed on the outside. Um, they're really bad news as well. So um, if you ever see a balloon kind of drifting along that's half deflated, um, please grab that. Uh, it's, it's not a good thing to be uh, out, especially in the ocean. And while you're plurting, please share your adventures on social media using hashtag plurting because at Talking Birds, we really want to see what you're up to and we want to help celebrate your awesome efforts at being amazing. Um, and, and we hope that you sharing it on social media will also help your friends and your network know about what you're up to and they might decide to go plotting too which would only be a good thing for the planet so um pick up balloons try to reduce or remove your balloon use if you can and um share plotting on social media okay so our local r bird is a red wattle bird i'm sure everyone's seen red wattle birds flying around quite, quite big birds they're um the largest mainland honey eater Tasmania actually has a bigger wattle bird, the yellow wattle bird. But uh, for a honey eater, they're, they're quite big, uh, grey with white streaks, as you can see. Very raucous calls. They tend to um, 
see nomads flying around in flocks chasing nectar flows. Uh, I should also point out the red wattles. Nothing to do with the wattle trees. Uh, it's a flap of skin just below the eye or the cheek there, which gets longer and darker as the birds get older. So the little wattle bird, by comparison, which you might also see uh, uh, in your garden or perhaps along the creek, um, I tend to see the red wattle bird more often on the creek than the little wattle bird. It's a little bit smaller than the red and has no wattles and no yellow belly like the red wattle bird. But the little wattle bird does have a patch of rufous colour in the wings that you see when it's flying under the wing. I just want to quickly mention about balloons um, in Victoria. Just, just on the 1st of July, actually, this year, it's now uh, illegal to release balloons. So you get a hefty fine. So <laughs> hopefully those types of laws are, um, you know, sweeping through different parts of the world, um, which will hopefully make a really big difference about the amount of balloons we see uh, out in nature. Yeah, and actually, thank you, Julia. The um, Hillsville Sanctuary has a lot of stuff on their website about balloons um, too. So um, that's another place to check out. I don't know if they, I think they have a few alternatives, um, but the, the balloons blow, don't let them go. Folks have like pages of different ideas to use rather than balloons. For, for events. Um, Mum, um, so the little wattle bird is really not that little. No, it's, for a honey eater, it's quite big. It's just a little bit smaller than the red wattle bird. Um, <laughs> if, you're, if you're in North America, um, it's kind of like a small cuckoo, uh, like a yellow billed or a black billed cuckoo. Greater roadrunners are cuckoos, actually, so nothing like a greater roadrunner. <laughs> but <laughs> that, kind of, that, kind of, that kind of idea. Uh, anyone can go birding, just like anyone can go birding. Uh, and through my work with birdability, I'm a big advocate of that. Um, this illustration, pretty sure it was inspired by the birdability founder, Virginia Rose, who uses a manual wheelchair. And she looks a lot like that. Um, and that's an American dipper, which are really fun birds. They run around on rocks in creeks and streams. Mary Creek, I bet, would be a great place for a dipper. They dip, they like squat, they do lots of squats um, and they pick insects up out of the water and off rocks. Uh, cold, cold, like mountain streams. So they're pretty awesome. I haven't seen one yet. I'm really looking forward to, to finding a dipper sometime. But again, um, the lady in this graphic is using another pickup stick so she can reach those plastic bottles. Plastic is bad news. Plastic is always bad news because it doesn't decompose and animals eat it uh, by mistake. Um, so uh, again, picking up plastic is a great, a great way uh, to use your plurting um, for maximum benefit. Uh, and, and a pickup stick may help with that. Dippers are great birds, I can vouch for that. Um, but locally on the Mary Creek, we have dusky moorhens as a D bird. <laughs> um, they're not ducks. They're part of the rail and crakes family, and they constantly flick their tail up and down like most rails. They've got a quite a, a loud sort of shriek call, which you can hear even before you see them. So you might see them swimming along the Mary Creek or walking through the, um, the grasses on the bank. They have long, thin toes. They're not, they don't have webbed toes like, um, like ducks, but they're good at walking on um, aquatic plants and through the grass. And the, it's very easy to identify them from their red frontal shield above their, above, between their eyes, uh, which extends down onto the beak and um, which has a yellow tip if they're, if they're an adult. But I've got a photo here of the immature, just to, just to confuse you, uh, they don't have any of that colour. On their bill at all. So if you see a very dull, dark grey, brown, bluish grey <laughs> sort of duck sized bird on the creek, it might be an immature dusky moorhen, probably hanging around with its parents. So they, they um, the, the, the uh, pairs of moorhens um, stay together all the time and their, family, their offspring stay with them for quite a while. If you're in North America, uh, why yes, in fact, the dusky moorhen looks a lot like a purple or swamp gallinule because it is a gallinule. Uh, so if it looks familiar, that's why they're in the same family. Hey, Mum, I'm just watching the time and... Yes. We better race along, haven't we? <laughs> we better race. We've got three more letters. <laughs> I, I saw Inca dove. Inca doves are very cute. Every, um, all their feathers have a little black border, which is sort of why they look in that illustration like they have kind of waves on their feathers. Um, another way to go plurting is 
if you see a trash bin, a, a trash can, a garbage can out in the world and um, stuff has not made it in, you can pick it up and put it in. Uh, that counts as plating. Every little bit you do helps. Every piece of litter you take out of the environment helps. You don't have to have a huge garbage bag that you fill up every time you go outside. I mean, if you want to, that's fabulous, but you don't have to. Um, make plating work for you because then you're more likely to do it more. And um, and doing it as much as you as you like uh, is very, very helpful. Um, another thing that's worth mentioning, um, I don't know what it's like in Australia, but sometimes here in the US when um, big events happen, uh, the, the folks who are picking up litter, who are emptying the trash cans at like national parks and stuff uh, are not working and the trash cans end up overflowing terribly. So please don't add to that problem by adding your trash to the overflowing trash can. That doesn't help. That counts as littering. Uh, and if you would like, you could pick up some of other people's trash and just take it with you to the next available place to dispose of it properly instead of leaving it out there to blow around and get in the way. Okay. Our eye bird is the Australian white ibis. Uh, it's it's called the farmer's friend in, in rural areas because they uh, flocks of ibis converge on locust plagues and gobble them up, so they're very valuable. But in the cities, they, they are scavengers and they tend to scavenge in uh, landfill sites or uh, rubbish bins that are overflowing or leftover picnic um, scraps. And so they're called tip turkeys or bin chickens. And... Uh, can see the featherless head it makes it good for dipping your head into gooey <clears throat> anyway <laughs> gooey things to feed on and um at Coburg Lake they found the island quite to their liking to, to breed in the last few years and the numbers have really built up become such a problem that um other sea other water birds have, have departed the the lake and the uh, Moreland Council is, in, is developing a management plan to try and reduce their numbers Another way to go plurting, to sort of focus and structure your plurting efforts is to adopt a spot. Uh, in North America, there are lots of cities and counties um, and states where you can adopt a spot, adopt a trail, adopt a highway, um, where uh, you and a group of friends maybe are responsible for um, picking up all the trash in that area. Of course, you don't need to formally adopt a spot to adopt it in your heart. Uh, and doing that, focusing your efforts on one place, if you go patch birding uh, regularly to the same place or the same general area, it's really fun to see over time how your efforts are paying off. And if people, um, other people are regulars in that area too, they might see what you're doing and might get inspired to, um, to help as well. Uh, these are two white-breasted nuthatches. They're incredibly cute. Um, they hop around upside down and um, backwards, like head, not backwards, head first down, down tree trunks, picking up little bugs and stuff from the cracks between um, bark and they're very gorgeous they're also the bird ability logo uh, so I'm a little bit biased. We have similar birds in Australia the tree creepers and the satellas but they live in the forest so we don't get them along the Merry Creek we haven't planted quite enough trees yet <laughs> one day perhaps um, but we do have the very elegant Nankeen night heron uh, here's one uh, at Jones Park wetland again in East Brunswick they are night herons, they're called night herons because they're mostly nocturnal. They, during the day, they roost in trees near water. Um, they have two white, long white plumes when they're breeding. You can see one plume coming down from the head in this, in this bird. They eat fish and other aquatic animals. So it's quite, uh, quite exciting to find a night heron along the creek or perhaps around Edwards Lake. And in North America, there are black crown night herons and there are yellow crown night herons, and they have amazing plumes too, and they look really similar. Um, if you're curious, Nankeen is referencing the colour. Uh, apparently, that is the colour that that rusty kind of reddish, buffy um, brown kind of colour that that this beautiful bird is sporting. And finally. Um, like I mentioned, you don't have to have any special equipment and you don't have to take huge amounts of trash out of the environment every time you go plurting. A little bit, a little, a little bit mm, uh, <laughs> really helps. Um, this guy is looking at a juror falcon or a gurr falcon or a jeer falcon because no one knows how you say that name. Um, it's this beautiful <laughs> raptor that's way up, up far north. I haven't run into one yet. I haven't been in cold enough places at the right time of year. Um, 
looks like a, a big snowshoe hare is about to um, meet its death. But this bloke has designated one or maybe both of those drink bottle pockets on the side of his backpack to put his trash in. So that way he can have his hands free for his hiking pole and his binoculars, but he can still be packing some trash out with him um, easily without carrying anything extra. So there's lots of creative ways you can go plotting. It doesn't have to be one particular way. Um, so expand your brain and, and find, find a way that, that works for you um, so that you want to do it. So our final our final bird is for, for G is the golden whistler, which is one of my favourite birds. It's beautiful. The male, that is, um, the female is a simple grey. Still very, very pleasant bird to see. Uh, they feed on insects and spiders and things in the mid to lower canopy. So you might see one if you're poking around looking for litter along the creek. Um, most often seen along the Mary Creek in the cooler months, so they have a very musical whistle, which when you get to know it, you'll, you'll be able to tell that there's one in the, in the neighbourhood as soon as you hear it. It might be quite a bit, a bit harder to find, even though they're, oh, they're so bright. They, uh, if they turn their backs to you in the, in the trees, you, you won't see it. And here's a great opportunity to give a shout out to the Merry Birds calendar, because if you have this year's Merry Birds calendar, um, you will have noticed this little friend on your calendar about two or three or four, whatever day it is, ago, because it's a September bird. Yay! Um, we, have, we have one of the Merry Creek bird calendars up here. I, I'm currently living in Alabama. Um, it gives my husband great joy every month to discover which bird friend will be uh, gracing our kitchen. Uh, and we had one last year when we were in Kentucky. So it's fun to travel with, with this um, great thing. So I believe tw the 2022 Merry Bird calendar will be uh, on sale shortly. Is that right? Indeed. So Amy producing another calendar next, for next year and more wonderful photos of Merry Birds. They'll be available uh, directly from 80 or through Friends of Mary Creek. So uh, keep a look out on, on the Friends of Mary Creek uh, uh, website. 80 might be able to tell us when, when, which month to look out, when they'll be available for sale in the chat and tell us. So that's all from us about plotting. Um, my email address is down there. I can also put that in the chat if you had any questions, but please check out our website about all these other plotting strategies that might be of interest to you. Uh, and I will stop sharing my screen. <laughs> Thank you so much, Freya and Anne. I think we can all agree that was just fantastic. And I think it's just hopefully inspired a few of you to get out there when it's not raining, um, or even if it is raining, um, and get out there and really explore um, your local area. Though I know a lot of us are already exploring those areas already, but it'd be great to even make them look a bit uh, a bit more attractive and obviously reduce the amount of litter ending up in our creeks and then ending up in the ocean. So I do a lot of um, training uh, people how to pick up litter safely, which doesn't take very long, but it's one of those things I think we've tried to be really careful about when we are going plurting or picking up litter with a group. Um, there's some, I guess some really simple steps that you can do. A lot of this information I'm gonna share is actually on the Friends of Mary Creek uh, website under a litter, litter collection. So I'll, I'll put that in the chat before we finish today as well. So you, you can have a look at that information as well. I've also got a Facebook page, Mary Creek Litter Cleanups. And I must say, I'm talk, we're all talking about Mary Creek a lot today, but obviously this is relevant for any creeks, rivers around Victoria, Australia, the US, the world. So it's it's all pretty relevant for anywhere really. Um, so good thing to do is pick a location first where you're going to go. So it might be your normal walk that you do. Uh, it might be something you can do in consultation with me. If it's on the Mary Creek or the Mooney Ponds Creek, I know both creeks very well. And I can certainly talk to you about areas that are actually quite safe to go. And there's certain areas that you shouldn't go. We don't encourage people to pick up litter uh, in the water itself either, um, especially if it, we've just had a lot of rain. Um, so if you see some areas where you can see a lot of litter and you're a bit concerned about it, but it's not safe for you to go and pick it up, you can actually talk to your local council and the local uh, water board. Um, in, in Melbourne, it's Melbourne Water that looks after our in-stream rivers. So that's a, you can talk to them about actually having some trained people to actually come and pick up the litter. Uh, pick a date and time to go out, either if you're going out with your household or with one buddy at the moment in Melbourne, and always check the, the Victorian Government COVID uh, page for what current restrictions are. Uh, Yet yeah, check the weather forecast and ensure the water level of the creek is not too high. You can see in this picture here on the left, that's the Merry Creek in flood. So, uh, and of course, 
where we are living in a lot of cities, we've got a lot of um, concrete areas, a lot of uh, hard surfaces. So when even if it rains 10 millimetres, that can go into our creeks really, really quickly. So you've got to be careful that you're not going at, at times when the floodwaters are going to be up too high. Um, so always check the weather before you go out. Read the safety information on the Friends of Mary Creek litter collection page. Take your gloves uh, if you need or, or a bag and a litter pickup stick to pick up your litter. And as I mentioned before, I've got plenty of them via click and collect at the moment. Um, if you can, it's great to get to the site where you're going to be picking up litter and take a photo of what it looks like before you picked up the litter uh, and even afterwards. Um, and you can actually post them um, on Instagram, uh, Friends of Mary Creek Instagram page, or I've got a, a page called Mary Creek Water Watch or on the Facebook page, Mary Creek Cleanups. And to show us some, it's really nice to share at the moment what people are doing out in, in different creeks. Hey, this is what the creek looked like and now look what it looks like now. Taking the litter home, of course, and disposing of it, it's, it's really important. Um, most councils will actually offer that service. You can actually contact them on their website. But at the moment, because in Melbourne in particular, because we're in lockdown, probably best to take it home with you. So it's really good that Freya mentioned, you know, just taking one bag and filling that up. You might even... Um, perhaps pick an item that you're most concerned about. At the moment, for example, I'm noticing a lot of face masks. So that might be a good one to try and just pick those up in particular because they've got a lot of plastic in them. So if it's too overwhelming to pick up everything, maybe just pick one item and, and take them home and, and start with that. The other thing I just wanted to mention while I've got you all, um, is that we're actually in Victoria and I'm sure the US has something similar. I think it's called Literati. I know there's an app there and there's probably a number of other apps that we collect information on our litter now because obviously we don't want to be picking up litter forever. We want to actually see some change. But in order to see change, we need data. So what what's really great um, that and I'll share I'll share my screen with this too to show you really quickly is there's actually um, some great portals out there at the moment and I'll just sort of move this across so you can see it there. Um, this one's in Victoria, it's called Litter Watch Victoria. Anyone can join, you can register uh, when you log in to actually upload what you found and even if it's just one item, if you went out for an hour and picked up 20 face masks, it's a really good thing to, to put that on, the, on this website or send it to me and I'll put it up. One of the great things that you don't have to log in or register is it's got a great mapping tool. So all you have to do is press mapping up the top there and it's got the whole of Victoria, but I'm just going to focus on the Merry Creek today. And you can actually just go into litter data and pick uh, surveyed. So where have people been, sur have been surveying? And oop, we'll go back to Melbourne and you'll actually get to see all these red dots that I think that are slowly just coming up. So this shows where people have actually already been kick, picking up litter. And you can see a lot of it, those wavy lines, is actually the Mary Creek. So there's been a lot of people really actively already picking up litter. So each of those dots you can actually click on and you can actually see well, what, what have people been finding. So this is just a summary. It'll just tell you how many pieces. So the litter's picked up by pieces. So even if it's a small, tiny piece of macro plastic, that's counted as one piece. So for example, the two surveys were done in this area, one in 2019 and one in 2020, and uh, three people picked up 21 pieces. So that probably were quite large pieces, or maybe they just had one bag. Maybe they were focusing on one thing. Whereas down here, we had 90 people collecting over a thousand pieces of, of litter. So it can really vary. Another great thing this, uh, this website has is you might want to know, well, what's been collected over a longer period of time? So let's have a look. The Friends of Mary Creek have been collecting data for about three years now. And we haven't got all the information up here yet, but just when people are happy to pick it up, because I know for some people pick, collecting data isn't the most exciting thing. So that, that can be something that I, I, I guess I'm really trying to encourage people to do, but I know it's not the most exciting thing, but it's really good when we can actually look at the data. So here we go, we've got Friends of Mary Creek uh, at four sites. So there actually are a lot more sites that people are collecting litter, but these are the ones that we have the most data at the moment. If we only have one piece of information, it's not really a trend. So we, the data is not as useful. So it's, we really want people to go back to the same sites again and again. So you can see here, Merry Cricket series. We've got four surveys that have been completed. I know there's a lot more people picking up litter, but they're not. if they don't give me the data, I 
we, you know, it's not here, so we can't always report on it. But you can see here, there's four surveys here. Uh, the Mary Park Wetlands um, next to Northcote uh, High School, there's five surveys done. Uh, so there's been a really active group along the St George's bike path and they've got 21 surveys put in there. So that's the kind of thing we want. We want that amount of data because then you can really get to see uh, you know, some patterns and what's happening in that area. So what's really interesting about this graph is you can see that a lot of there's definitely quite a bit of polystyrene in certain areas. Um, not next to the, so this is actually at the Rushall train station uh, in the city of Yarra. You can see not much polystyrene there, but the, the aqua is plastic. And you can see most of them have quite a lot of plastic. Remember this goes in numbers too. So it's the, the amount of pieces, not how heavy they were or anything like that. But you can see the main types of things that we're seeing is polystyrene, plastic, metal and glass. But overwhelmingly on the Mary Creek, as in probably lots of rivers and creeks around the world and in our oceans, about 70% of what we're picking up is actually plastic. And it's that soft plastic. So like from um, plastic bags breaking down or food packaging, um, people using uh, disposable cups and the lids, those are plastic bottles and the lids, those are the types of things we're seeing a lot in our rivers and creeks. So it's really, um, quite interesting to start seeing those trends but I guess I'm really doing a bit of a call out for for data the more information we have the more we can work out what the trends are to actually then make those changes talk to the land managers um, talk to enforcement if we have to issue fines and look at other ways to actually reduce these things like what we've got with the balloons at the moment that it's now illegal to release balloons because we had a lot of data on where the balloons were occurring and, and what damage they were they were making so we need that information but anyway, this is a really great, if you're into data, which you can tell I am, <laughs> uh, this is a really great um, website to explore uh, where people are picking up litter. And there's some really, inf actually, I was going to mention just really quickly, the Friends of Edwards Lake and Reservoir, or Reservoir, however you'd like to say it, have been collecting litter for quite a while, the last two years, and haven't got all their data in yet. They're still putting it in, but we're actually starting to see some really interesting trends in their data as well. So this is actually at the, the lake itself. Then we've got um, the car park of a hotel right next to the lake. And then we've actually got some from the wetlands. But you can see it's quite interesting. The lake hotel, which is a smaller area, the car park, has heaps more litter than where we found around the lake itself. And the lake itself, unfortunately, does have a lot of people that picnic, nothing wrong with picnicking, but unfortunately a lot of people in that area picnic and then they just get up and they leave their litter there. So the friends group are having to pick up quite a lot of that litter. But even so, even though there's a lot of litter in the park, there's actually a lot more in the car park. So we're still getting a lot of people uh, going to a car park, eating takeaway food, and then just chucking their litter outside and leaving it. And the problem in that area in particular is it's right next to a creek, the Merry Creek, the, sorry, the Edgars Creek, which flows into the Merry Creek. So we're getting a lot of litter there. So this, is, this can be really powerful, this tool, to have this information about what's occurring in a different area and seeing those patterns. But I will stop sharing there now um, because I see what time it is. It's time for us to nearly finish. Um, and I'm sure there might be some questions or things that people might want to add. Julia, the questions have been answered by everyone so actively. Oh, cool. Um, kind of functional through the chat, asking each other questions. And the group is so well informed and linked up to information that they've been answering and supplying each other all the way through. So. It's just been really rich in the background there on chat. Every time I've gone to enter something, someone's jumped the gun. So thanks, everyone, for being such a, you know, obviously a really active group of um, participants in this conversation. You know, we call it a webinar, but really it's a, it's a wonderful conversation. And it's so amazing as well to be thinking about this local area, but connecting with American audience as well. Thank you, Freya. No worries. And um, if it's all right, I see uh, Ray uh, in the audience and um, this, we're, this is totally on the spot. Ray didn't get any warning. Ray, um, Julia mentioned to me earlier that you might want to say a couple words about Talking Birds and invite folks to listen. Oh, thank you, Freya. Yes, uh, I don't have anything prepared, but uh, you know a lot about Talking Birds as well. We've been doing our show for about 15 years. And it's all about birding. And over the last few years, and with a lot of help from Freya, too, we've uh, become more of a conservation 
focused show. And um, one thing I might say about that is when we started kind of easing into doing more conservation themes within the show, we wondered, you know, how people would respond to that and whether they would say, why don't you just talk about birds? Um, but it's been really gratifying to see that um, that has not been the response. We, we get wonderful feedback from people about talking about conservation and things like uh, flirting and just picking up litter in general and being aware of plastic pollution, for example, in creeks and rivers and, and uh, in our oceans. So we're kind of gratified to be able to keep that conservation focus going. And uh, we're really hoping to connect with some bigger organizations as we go along to kind of advance the, uh, the whole litter cleanup idea and, you know, recognizing what a world scale problem it is and trying to do our little part to help uh, inform people and, and, uh, and maybe inspire people to uh, get involved. As, as you guys are doing in such a beautiful way. Yeah, it is a worldwide phenomenon, um, litter and particularly plastics and litter, uh, but it's so great to see so many people are wanting to do something about it. So I think that definitely gives us hope. And even in the world at the moment, in a pandemic, there are still some things um, that we can all do, um, which I think is really important. I think I'd just like to say thank you to everyone. Did Anne and Freya want to say anything to finish off before we sign off? Oh, I'd just like to thank everyone for, for tuning in and um, hope to see you out on the creek looking at birds in the, in the future when we're allowed to get together again. And picking up litter, of course. We'll of to course. Have <laughs> to add that in. <laughs> I'm thinking on our, on our bird survey routes that are, uh, that are, in fact, out there and back again, we could be aiming to pick up some litter on the way back when we're not uh, looking at the birds so intensively. And collect the data too, maybe. Or is oh, that asking indeed. too much? Yeah, we could try that too. <laughs> can always try. Yeah, and um, thanks, thanks, Julia, and thanks, um, everyone, for, for coming in. Uh, I am an occupational therapist, which is a healthcare profession, so I never thought I would have a chance to present alongside my mum um, <laughs> <laughs> because on the surface, our careers do not align at all, but look at this um there you go so that's that's just a really fun um bonus for me so thanks thanks everyone for coming and um i hope to hear about and see about your planning adventures uh, on social media thanks so much thanks everyone and thanks angela for looking after the chat for us and um everyone have a lovely evening if you're in the states or have a lovely morning or afternoon if you're in australia enjoy enjoy thank you so much for joining us <laughs>